actually quite an exciting event because uh, not only is it the first time that we have had students speaking with the Royal Scottish Geographical Society in a while, it's also partnering with several student organisations such as the Geographical Society, um, the Glasgow University Environmental Sustainability Team, Exploring Society and several things. Uh, our next speaker is Jenny Newell. She has uh, been on a number of expeditions over her time at university, now uh, in fourth year about to graduate um, with an earth science degree. Like most things in life, you do need to start small um, and gain the experience to work up to the, uh, the big goals. Um, so where did it all begin? Well, in my spare time, this is the kind of stuff I love doing. Um, I'm always, every opportunity I can, out in the hills. So it's no surprise that my story begins in the Arctic. Um, in 2011, just before starting university, um, I went on an expedition to Svalbard, which is here, um, nicely in the, uh, right as close to the North Pole as you can get on land. Um, it was with the British Coast Exploring Society, or now known as uh, British Exploring, that I went out to the Arctic with. Um, British Exploring are like a youth development charity, um, and I've done like, a fair bit with them since. And basically they're um, kind of getting youth like, kind of developing, and, and I've learned so much in everything that I've come from my time with British Exploring. And they do it by mixing adventure with science. Um, so the adventure begins with basically training you up in the kind of winter skills and the glacier travel um, skills that you need to safely go onto the ice caps and glaciers. Um, so as learning the rope skills so we can travel in glacier teams. Um, cutting up in the crampons, um, as, as Chris mentioned, the first time you put that on, it's a kind of walking like a cowboy is a thing to get used to. Um, basically, we got all the skills that allowed us to be able to safely travel on top of and underneath the glacier. Um, and yeah, it's all about adventure. Before we even got to our base camp, it was an adventure. This was our travel, our journey in um, to our base camp was near the Von Spring Glacier, um, about an hour's boat ride from Longyearbyen. And as you can see, it was pretty magical. And these boats going through the ice floes at times, you felt like you were kind of just hovering above the ice, and at other times you could put your hands out and, and literally touch it. Um, for me, Svalbard is where it all began. Um, I got an introduction to life in the field and, and roughing it, I guess. And yeah, we were always camping, um, so after a long day kind of trekking or, or learning skills, you then had to set up your tent and, and cook your dinner. Um, and then when you woke up, probably still quite tired from a bit of lack of sleep, you had to pack it all up and carry it on your back. Um, and also, like, kind of, you learn to live off of ration pack, dehydrated food that um, takes a little bit of getting used to, uh, lack of showers, uh, and using nature's toilet. Um, so all these things were skills that I was gaining that would enable me to then um, go on and do the field work that I've done since. The following year, I went back out with British Exploring and uh, went out as an assistant leader to Arctic Norway. Um, here, the adventure continued. Um, we were climbing through boulder fields, uh, summiting majestic peaks, and kind of getting as close as you can to some, some pretty neat crevasses. In fact, later on, we go down one, um, purposefully. And we got to do some ice climbing um, and venturing into the crevasses. So this was a, um, at the side of the glacier, and the crevasse just opened up. And you could literally just walk in for a good hundred or so metres and you definitely needed your head torch at that point because all light had gone. And what was really interesting is from the geography courses that we've done here, you know that especially in summer, glaciers have these massive diurnal cycles of the, the water flow. Um, but what we noticed was that although we saw this massive diurnal cycle on the actual glaciers, we, we definitely noticed this kind of increase in the water flow. However, that didn't really relate down to what we were measuring um, below. And we kind of thought about it, and, and from our observations being on the glacier, put this down to the fact that the superglacial flow that we were measuring was just a tiny percentage of all the meltwater that was traveling through that glacier. And it made sense as soon as you were back on the glacier and everywhere that you were walking, you could just hear the thunder of water and crevasses below you. And those were crevasses you didn't want to go down. Um, so following on from um, my time out with Norway, I went out with a Northern Exposure. So this was with a couple of the guys from the team in Svalbard that I first went out with in the summer. Um, we returned in the spring, um, running a kind of Arctic experience course. 
And kind of the first thing that really stood out to me was just the huge change, um, kind of the seasonal change in how long you've been lived. So this is a picture in the summer when I was first there. And returning in spring, this picture, the, um, the house that was in the foreground of the last picture is like just below us here. So as a dusting of snow, the, the glacier is still at the same point, but it just looks like hugely different. Uh, and it was really like the Arctic that I was looking for. Um, in my adventures. Um, the Tuna Green Glacier that I first mentioned back in 2011, um, you had the fjord coming right up to it and kind of active carving that you couldn't sleep through the night kind of without being woken up at some point by a massive iceberg crashing off of it. This was it in the uh, spring. This is all snow. We um, skidooed right up to it. There was very little coming off of it. It was much more static. Um, uh, and yeah, just such a significant change from kind of just a few months apart in what the, uh, the sun can do to ice, I guess. Um, however, even in adventure, you can still find science. So we found these ice caves in the glacier um, just up in the uh, Longyearbyen Glacier. And we adventured into them. You can see different kind of layers of sediments in there, shown better here. My face shows the uh, nervousness that I felt as I was lowered down to the bottom of the glacier. Um, and below me, I couldn't see how far I was going. Um, I could hear the glacier like, like creaking all around me. So it was kind of nerve wracking, but definitely worth it for, for views like that, seeing the, the layers upon layers of, kind of action of the glacier. Um, so yeah, that was Valbar for My time in the Arctic definitely taught me a lot about um, seeing geography so much different from what you see in the textbooks. Before I went out to Svalbard, I generally thought that like a moraine was like a little pile of sediments, not the two and a half hours walk from base camp to the glacier of kind of boulders bigger than me that we had to get through. So um, definitely gave a whole new perspective on, on what you've learned in the textbooks. Coming on from that, uh, the, the experience that I had, um, I was offered the opportunity to be a field work assistant and a very different part of the world, um, venturing off to Africa. Um, so I was here at the Menengai Caldera, this panoramic that's um, embedded here, um, only shows a section of the Menengai Caldera. It's the second largest by area um, caldera in the world. Um, the caldera is basically where a volcano has collapsed in on itself, um, and you're left with this massive depression. Um, and um, I was out with uh, Helen Robinson, who's a PhD candidate here at the University of Glasgow, um, and she's doing the uh, modelling the geothermal subsurface. So what we were doing in Kenya was looking for structures such as faults and slick and lines um, and more faults. And we were measuring them to kind of for Helen to then be able to put this into her subsurface modelling. And um, yeah, Helen's currently processing all of this information and data that we collected um, towards her PhD. Um, so yeah, what's next? So all these uh, kind of expeditions um, have been building towards uh, kind of making it a career. Um, the, the next stage is we've got an exploration society expedition going out to study Aldani Lengai, which is the world's only carbonatite volcano. And it's one of these things that if I hadn't had the experience with Svalbard, if I hadn't had the leadership experience um, with Norway, it's something that we couldn't be putting together just now. Um, and also, like these things pay off. So at times it was a lot of hard work trying to balance getting out as much as possible and doing these expeditions with also trying to get a degree. Um, but it certainly pays off because the ultimate goal has been achieved and um, as a, a result of these um, adventures I've been telling you about, I've now landed a PhD um, that will take me to Antarctica in December. And one of the things that I just wanted to highlight is I focused on the time that I spent outside of Scotland, but actually in my time here, four years you do a lot of field work, all of it's in Scotland, um, and it's beautiful, it's fantastic.